Okay. Um, hey, everybody. Um, I'll introduce myself first. My name is Konstantin Iskov. I go by Costa. Um, I am a co-founder and CTO of Fidemine. Uh, we are a um, retail bundling technology. And I'll go into what that means. Um, for, for this presentation in general, I was hoping to kind of like leave you guys with a little bit some knowledge. Um, so what I'll do is I'll explain a little bit about what my company does. And then I'll also explain a little bit about how we scale ML. How, basically how we are able to serve millions of requests that require uh, some predictions on the fly. Um, this is our team. This is currently our team. Um, we are five people, majority women. That's unique. Uh, uh, we are fully funded, so we are also uh, looking for engineers. If anybody is applying, find me after this. Um, it's myself and my co-founder, Michelle Bakarak. Okay, so the problem we're solving, and I'll explain this in terms of my, uh, my wonderful wife. Um, she is uh, an avid shopper. She always goes online, and she shops a lot. Uh, and in fact, she shops so much that recently she uh, got a letter from Bloomingdale saying that uh, over 88% of what she bought, she's returned. And, she, and they're asking her if there's any way they can help her to shop better. Um, so the problem is that uh, when we shop for things, we actually want to buy things in context. And it's sort of not possible currently on, uh, online. Uh, because the way we shop right now, you get kind of like categorizations and, and breakdowns of different, of, of different structures. So if you, go to, uh, if you go to Amazon, you see some category, drop down, another category, another drop down. Uh, but when we shop for things, we actually want to buy things in context. We shop for um, pants because we have a shirt that we want to buy. Um, because uh, we have a shirt that we already have. We buy for hat because we want to go somewhere. Um, so the problem is that in order for retailers to actually create um, curation, they have to do it manually. So they have to create some one-to-one -one, uh, associativity be between every product. Now, as an example, Macy's has about 50,000 products live at any given moment. Um, and that's not... not feasible to actually uh, generate a, 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 curated, a curated bundle for every single product in order to make a recommendation. So the solution, um, our idea was to create some sort of an API, um, use ML to classify um, the different products, figure out how to actually put them together and serve that as a recommendation. So as a, pro as a product itself, we are the system behind the scenes. We are not a particular, we're not, we are the API. So this is a study case that we have. Um, so as you see, um, we are generating the complete look below the, uh, below the, the man. The way the system, the system gets a request from the user whenever, um, whenever a user actually logs into the website. Uh, where we get a request, we uh, basically we all we get is a, a URL. It says a user is visiting a particular web page. Um, our system has to classify and figure out what product this is. Once it does that, it has to match and figure out a bundle of products that would actually match it, and then recommend it. Um, one of the things that we saw when we started doing this is we saw a ridiculous increase in, in upsell. Um, and in part because shoppers won't actually are more likely to buy if you suggest a full, uh, complete the look, if you suggest a, a full bundle. Even if you're not actually buying um, the whole bundle, just by uh, sort of helping you. It's kind of like the, it's kind of like the, the book, the, the movie that, that describes the book. Um, Um, so this is uh, one of the things that we one of the things we encountered throughout the process is that we wanted to create a, well, our users actually our, our mer the merchants that we are providing service to wanted to control the recommendations 
which, uh, which totally makes sense. In particular, the customer that I was giving you as an example over here, John Barbados. John Barbados is uh, high-end fashion. They sell every, every product is about $2,000 worth. Um, and so they really want to curate what they're recommending. However, so in, in a sense, when they're actually curating this, um, they sort of want one-to-one uh, one -one matching. But the reality is that they don't want one-to-one -one matching because they actually want to serve throughout their entire site um, recommendations. Uh, and so in order to kind of uh, adjust to, to, to this demand, we've created a dashboard which um, essentially just allows our, our retailers to um, have access and control the ML behind the scenes. Um, in a sense, these days, what we use this primarily for is this is our where a lot of our learning data is coming from. So we allow this, we give this dashboard as a as an access for our customers. Our customers are actually logging into it, and they are able to uh, create recommendations. So they create bundles by themselves, and also we have internally users that um, create these bundles by themselves, and then we use these bundles all sort of the way you see it here. Each, each row is a bundle, um, and we use these bundles as the learning data to understand um, what is it comprised of. Okay. So how does it work? And at this point, like I'll start going a little bit more into technical stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, just as a as a note, I am an engineer, um, not a data scientist. So if you are a PhD in ML, don't tackle me with like too hard of a question. Um, but I'll try answering any, any question you, you want because I do a lot of this uh, on a day by day. Um, so the process goes sort of like this. Uh, first, we ingest the product feed. We get a lot of products from our customers and we, um, we pipe them through, uh, through a bunch of classifiers that try to detect what, uh, what product it is. Now, as a company, we don't concentrate, we, we sort of don't do things uh, we, we do things holistically. We don't concentrate on an individual ML. We don't do like visual uh, ML or, um, or, or NLP. We sort of like a, take a different approach depending on the problem. Um, so when we get a request, when we get all of these feeds, and essentially these feeds contain a bunch of unstructured data. In particular, uh, as far as we're concerned, uh, they contain the URLs. So what we would take is we would grab all the URLs, well, the first thing we'll do is we'll actually go and scrape all the information. Once we have scraped all the information, we're going to start classifying different pieces of attribute, uh, different pieces of attributes of different uh, products. So, an attribute would be something like a color. Um, so, detecting a color would require detecting the image. Detecting an image would require to understand, like, parsing the actual HTML and so on and so forth. And so we do this kind of like on every single parameter that you might think of, and probably on some parameters that you might not think of. Um, like really abstract parameters that we've, we've been asked by our clients were things like parkers. Um, so some customers have, um, um, they sell shoes, and they sell like, let's say, LeBron James shoes. Uh, so LeBron James would be like a partner. Um, so they, their feed information doesn't actually contain this in, this this kind of like classification. And you wouldn't say um, LeBron James. Uh, instead, what they would do a lot of the times is they would put information inside of their titles, put information inside of their descriptions, and so on and so forth. And so some of the process is going to be um, actually parsing the, de uh, the details information, parsing the titles, and classifying the actual words, trying to figure out with some level of accuracy whether or not this is a good Um once we do that, we go through the process of actually generating um, bundles. So we um, um, we use the information that we, the, the information that we get from the dashboard. We actually use those uh, pieces of pieces of outfits um, to generate additional outfits um, with some level of um, entropy. So if you have, if you're, if you know that you're wearing, if I'm wearing red and blue jeans then I can probably replace these genes with other types of genes, and this is going to make sense to some degree. Um, so what we do is we actually do this on a, on a mass scale. We, uh, we run through the algorithms a lot, and we actually permute a lot of different possibilities. 
and we put them back onto the dashboard to, um, to run through an approval process where both our admins and uh, our clients will go through and they're actually kind of like proving these outputs. Um, the last process would be uh, approving and the, the final process is actually getting the recommendation when we get a request from the end users where we try to figure out where this particular product sit, lives and, and we're gonna present a few recommendations with some variation. Um, they, there, there's always a level of um, um, difference or the, there's always a level of entropy and we usually tend to, um, we have um, pretty, um, to be constant uh, thresholds to figure out what kind of entropy it is for the different stores. Okay, so how do you scale this? So as you see, one of the things that I was describing here is sort of like you go through a lot of process of uh, running a lot of recommendations, uh, a lot of a lot of different algorithms, and some of these algorithms are actually some of these algorithms require a lot of training. Some of these algorithms re require um, uh, not so much training, but they require to run on a, on a particular machine, like uh, like a GPU unit. Some of these algorithms might require um, uh, to be distributed, um, and so so I'll give you like a quick sort of like a, a really quick uh, uh, overview over here of our of our actual system or our architecture. We have something. Uh, called an a Feynman instance, and the Feynman instance has um, a back end that basically it's a communication server, a front end that's the API side. Um, we have workers, workers are, are the scrapers, so workers are the ones who actually use uh, ML, they need to run it, and they're distributed, so they're not, they're across many, many, many different machines. And we have a temple, and I'll go into the temple, and so what the way you need to think about the temple is sort of like a lambda on AWS, except that it's distributed. Um, it's not run in a single, you know, on a single place. Now, when you, if you imagine this um, kind of entire description within one um, particular region, and you start scaling this to cross multiple regions, um, you're going to run into a lot of problems. Ignoring the database issues and ignoring uh, sort of the, the standard engineering problems, some of the issues that you might, some of the issues that you're going to start running into in terms of ML are going to be quite complex. So, and I, and I kind of listed some of them here just to just to point out. Um, so some of them are immense training time. Uh, if you run it across different machines, you have to train them differently. Uh, sometimes it might be the same model, and um, if you're running it across different machines and it's the same model, you might be getting different predictions from the same model. So a lot of the time, people would kind of go. Um, towards centralizing it in, in one place. Um, some models require retraining. Over time, um, over time, we want to retrain these models because they're not performing so well. Um, um, a big one, which is going to be network, slow network, if you are distributing it across many machines and you're actually trying to send millions of requests that require prediction, um, some of these predictions are really slow and so you have to account for network requests. Um, so what I want to go into is how do we actually solve this problem? How do we uh, totally avoid this? Um, so this is our stack. How many, just by a show of hands, so I, I have a sense of how deep you go into it. How many of you know what Bazel is? Okay, how many of you know what PAX is? <laughs> Docker? Okay, Docker is great. <laughs> okay, so a ba Bazel, is, um, Bazel is actually still in beta. Uh, it is uh, based on something called um, uh, Blaze, and it is the Google um, language agnostic build system. So if any of you ever programmed in C, and you kind of have this um, um, uh, uh, make files, so it's like make files with steroids. Uh, essentially, you kind of create different constructs to build things, and, and you can build them. And I'll go into, I, I, what I, one of the things that I want to do is I want to make sure that I give you a little deeper knowledge of actually how it works. Um, PAX, on the other hand, uh, is called Python executables, um, and I'll go into that too. And so in a, sen in a sense, the way we work basically is to solve for this problem, we're essentially using Bazel to, um, to, to program different components of different models separately. Um, then we put them all together using PAX, and then we distribute them using a Docker container, and we actually distribute it through a registry, and um, you can act, it runs locally. So because it runs locally on every every machine, wherever there is a worker, 
um, the, the latency in time is actually really slow. Uh, it was really fast. So how does um, text work? So in Python, there's this concept um, of, <coughs> sorry. So in Python, there's this concept of running Python files. So I kind of wanted to show you what, what that means. Um, essentially, you can run Python files inside of um, zip files. So the way it works is like this. If, if you go to number one, in number one, you can kind of run, um, if you make a file and then you just run Python, the file name, it's just going to run it. And it's going to print out whatever, hello world. Now in Python, if you actually create a folder and you put inside of the folder a file called underscore underscore main underscore underscore uh, and then you run that folder, uh, Python is going to go and figure out that that file is inside there um, and it's going to run it. Now that actually extends much deeper um, and, and this has been since Python 2.7 or I think 2.6 even prob probably a little bit earlier. Um, but there's this notion you can actually archive the folder and run it and Python will will figure the same thing out. It will actually open it up. Um, and then the last step, which is, you can actually, once you have this archive, what you could do is you can actually um, put a shebang on it, um, an executable shebang. And once you do that, you can just make it executable, and you can run it. So what PEX is, is that with one addition, that uh, PEX takes a Python environment and put that in the, like, a, like a Python execution environment and put it inside of the file. What that allows you to do is that actually allows you to um, build Python libraries that you build by yourself um, together with the external libraries already packaged internally. So like if you are depending on PyBrains, PyBrains is going to get uh, packaged inside of your zip. If you're dependent on uh, uh, NumPy, NumPy is going to get packaged inside of the zip. And so what that allows you to do is actually allows you to distribute a file um, without ever having to install a single Python dependency anywhere. And you always get a single Python executable. So it's sort of like a compiled C file. Uh, Basal, on the other hand, is uh, allows you to do um, uh, a build tree. So uh, here's a, I took this example straight out of uh, Bazel documentation. So with Bazel, what we can do is um, you can create these kind of like dependency trees um, saying, you know, like I'm working, on, um, I'm working on X and X depends on Z and Y and Y depends on, on W and so on and so forth. And by doing that, whenever you run Bazel, Bazel is actually going to go and, and create a dependency tree and figure out the pieces that it needs to compile for you. Now, what it allows you to do from a development standpoint is, um, as, a, as an engineer, it actually allows you to separate the data scientists uh, that work on machine, uh, on machine learning models entirely from the project. Because then they can work only on a single individual component, let's say a, a queue, that is purely responsible for one particular prediction. And as they work on it, whenever they're done, they just you just plug it in and and you just run, you sort of plug it in and you can build um, um, your um, project with the particular model that you just created. So, okay. <laughs> so here I was trying to create like a, a, a basal example, like a, a more in-depth basal example. Um, yeah, I don't know. I actually created a basal example on GitHub, so if you want to just keep this process and uh, go figure out. So, but the most important part here is sort of like in, in, in part six, you can see, um, you can create these um, dependencies. So you, this is how you make it. You create a dependency, and so that's a binary, and it points to a, um, it points to a, a, a library dependency. And those two actually live in two separate folders as two entirely separate projects by themselves. And so you can run them, and as you run, as you run the build, the first one is gonna first go and build a second one, um, and then Pax is actually going to bundle them all together. Um, okay, so Tempo. What, what are you trying to achieve by that? So, thing? sorry? What do you try to achieve by all of this web of... Yeah, here I just put in like a, a useless example. This example actually doesn't do anything. Um, but the point here is what we're achieving by using Bazel is we're achieving... Um, 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 scalability from, from work perspective. So we have uh, data science engineers that are purely working on models. Like let's say um, an example of a model would be detecting uh, prominent, image prominence. 
So if you're working on an image prominence, that's sort of in a, in a context of a company or in a concept of, uh, in a context of a, an entire product, it doesn't actually make any sense. It's just a model. It does very something, something very, very specific, but you want to be able to allow uh, an engineer to work on that model, uh, have a deliverable within a sprint, and, and have some kind of result. So in order to do that, you have to allow them to, to work in an isolated way. Uh, what Bayes allows you to do is it allows them to create their own projects, work on these projects by themselves, um, write unit tests inside of the projects, which is very isolated, and when time comes, all you have to do is you have to all you have to do is just link by dependency to um, from the main project and use it inside of the main project. That in itself um, allows your engineers to kind of work without necessarily um, overlapping all the time in terms of like fixing bugs that have nothing to do with, with data science. I see this on and on and on where um, like engineers are great at fixing bugs. Data scientists are just not. And so um, when, when, they encounter, um, when they encounter bugs that have nothing to do with, with them, they may spend six, seven hours just trying to debug some problem for no reason. So this is that this ecosystem in itself allows you to kind of separate that out. Um, okay, so but if bugs already there, how will you how will you resolve it? Well, you can you can resolve it against the bugs that will be introduced later. But if bugs already there somewhere, in the right? But the person it does not help this thing. You're right. The person though that will the, the bug if the bug is already there, um, you're right to say that uh, there is a bug. But the person who's going to debug that bug is not going to be the data scientist. And that's really important to separate that because um, <coughs> it, it's very different work. It's a, it's a significantly different work um, looking at, a, at a, an enormous spreadsheet and trying to get an insight um, versus um, trying to figure out why there's a race condition. And for some reason, you're writing a particular piece of information and it's overwriting it twice, for example. Yeah. They shouldn't. That's my whole point. So how would it help them? It they, they even don't know. About they shouldn't know about it. If there is a bug, that's it's okay. It, it's okay that there is a bug. Somebody's going to debug it, not the data scientist. I'm, I'm sure the data scientist will start because they will not know that it's somebody else. No, they would. Um, they wouldn't know that the bug even exists from their perspective. Both actually, I think you both actually agree. Yeah, we do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would, I would love to talk to you after this, and I'll, I'll, I'm happy to explain more. Um, okay. What's the advantage of that over, say, just a classic version of the process? Sorry? What's the difference with something like Bayesian? The advantage of Bayesian over something like just a classic version of the process in your kit? So, so this is a version of the principle here. You know, if you, you're working on a sub module. And you've got other people developing on another part of the code base, but they're just different branches. Yeah. And so, therefore, you can isolate people from one part to another. Yeah. So, so a version control system like like Git, um, they're mutually exclusive. We use Git with Bazel. So, in in particular, we have um, sort of like the way Google or a lot of other big companies do it. We have a, a monolithic repository. So here is you kind of see like only you know you see uh, source, Python, and two projects. Well, for us, you see source, and then you see Python, and, and JavaScript, and C++, and so on and so forth. And we have a lot, a lot, a lot of projects. And in particular, a lot of our projects actually go into sections like common. Um, because some projects, let's, uh, um, as an example, I'll give you like a protobuf-oriented project. So let's say you have, um, I was giving here an, as an example, where you have uh, a backend. So a backend communicates between a lot of different systems um, the communication information, you will want to actually put it as a separate project because you don't want to be developing it more than once. And more than that, um, whoever is developing it, if that person is going to change that, you want that change to actually get reflected everywhere. So because it's going to be a separate project like that, over here, well, the second anybody is trying to build any part of the system and that particular part is dependent on that on that specific project, it will get rebuilt automatically from scratch, and it will run the unit test on it, 
and so, so that's why I'm saying it's, it's mutually exclusive from, uh, from Git. Git is great for a totally different reason. Okay, so how do you actually scale this? So given this information, um, the idea is very simple. We have something called Temple, and a Temple is a service in itself. It has its own API, it has, uh, it's a fully on, um, a full on application in itself. Uh, when we developed um, Temple, Temple depended on a bunch of models internally. So here's an example of these models. Now, when we develop these models, these models go by version, we version them, and, and we sometimes change these versions. But what it allows us to do is every time we release uh, new versions of models, we actually are able to um, simply comment out a few of the dependencies inside of, the ba inside of Bazel and rebuild Temple. And every time we rebuild Temple, we get a slightly different version of Temple that contains slightly different combination of models um, and potentially also different versions. And what we do with that then is we actually run it through training. So we, we put it inside of a, a Docker container. We run it through, through a training process. And wherever we're going to be running it through a training process, it's always going to be um, on the same machine wherever the database is because the training data someday is so massive, you don't want to be schlepping around um, the network. Once we train it, um, we're actually going to produce the coefficients for all of the different models. Not all models actually require coefficients, but for those that are, we're going to store the coefficients locally on, on the Docker itself. And we're going to uh, create an image out of the Docker and we're going to put it on the Docker registry. Now, with the Docker registry at that point, essentially we get um, we get a, a, a little sort of like a little service that this, that performs predictions. And when you load it, um, it preloads the same information that we trained previously for those models, and we can call it on demand. So, because it's a Docker container, now if we have a machine with 20 different workers, and each worker needs their own, um, needs their own pre like a predictive engine, it will just spawn a new container with the same models and perform these predictions. Um, cool, that's pretty much it for me. If you guys have questions. Um,